State your name for the record, please, sir. John Robin Nixon, N-I-X-O-N. All right, and where do you live now? Bippus, Indiana, B-I-P-P-U-S. And what do you do for a living? I'm a consultant in firearms, weapons systems, and explosives. All right, and do you have any academic degrees? I have a first class honor degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in business administration. All right, you use the term first class honors degree. That's something I don't think we usually hear in the US. Did you get that degree in the United Kingdom? Yes, I did. What is the meaning of the term first class? A bachelor's degree. There are two degrees. There's regular degrees and honor degrees, and a first class honors degree is at the top level that you can get. All right, and have you, how is having a degree in mechanical engineering related to the issue of what you do for a living? Firearms, ballistics, and explosives are all topics that mechanical engineering lends itself to very well. In mechanical engineering, you study physics, moving bodies, gases, fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, transfer of heat. Those are all subjects that lend themselves very well to the study of mechanisms and projectiles. All right, and you give, I don't want to spend much time on this, but give the court an idea of some of the things you've done in the field of mechanical engineering as it relates to firearms. I was employed by the UK government from 1986 until 1999. I worked on weapon systems, missile systems, explosives that included small arms. I've done additional education and training at the Royal Military College of Science, and those courses covered ballistics, guns, explosives, technology. All right. When I worked for the UK Ministry of Defense, I've done research, development design, midlife improvement programs, and foreign weapon evaluations. What? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and forensics, too. Now, how long have you been in the States? Since 2000. And have you done any work, specific work, in regards to the issue of firearms, tool mark analysis, or firearms identification? Yes. What sort of work has that been? That's been my own independent research and then consulting on legal cases such as we have here today. And do you consult for both prosecution and defense? I would do, I very rarely get hired by the prosecution. Okay, but you're not adverse to doing that if they ask you to review a case? No, I'll work for anybody. All right, and have you actually testified on this as an expert on the subject of firearms identification? Yes, I have. How many times? I haven't kept a count but probably over 10 in several states and federal courts. Now you've been involved in quite a number of additional cases involving the same subject, but you never testified, right? That's correct, yes. And why is that? Generally, if I come up with results which are not favorable to the side that hired me, they don't have me testify. All right, and that's happened a number of times. Yes, more times than what I've testified by a long way. All right. Now you actually do tool mark firearms examinations, correct? Yes, I have the microscopes and do that myself in my own lab. You have your own equipment? Yes. Do you have a side-by-side -side comparison microscope? Yes, I have several. Like the ones that were, we've heard talked about by the witnesses already in this case? Yes. Okay. And do you consider the practice of firearms examinations for identification purposes to be a science? Yes, I do. Okay, and explain that. Why do you say that? I think it involves a lot of technical areas, statistics, mechanical engineering, metallurgy, protection engineering, industrial engineering, so it certainly has the potential to be a very detailed science. Okay. Do you believe that as it exists now, the way that forensic firearms examiners do their work, is that scientific? It may be in some regards, but I don't believe it's any way near as scientific as it could be and uh, very much more of a black art than science. What do you mean black art rather than science? A good science is you should be able to get five people to do it and get the same results. And very often with the tool mark analysis, it comes down to subjective opinion. You don't always get a number of people coming up with the same opinion. Okay. Now you on your you put together a little slideshow and you've we've tried to cut it down last night in the interest of time, but your first slide, does this pretty well sum up your position on the practice of firearms slash tool mark analysis as it's done forensically today? Yes. My basic overall opinion is that it's a good tool for investigation. But the way that it's practiced at the moment or the current state of science it's not as mature as it could be, so I wouldn't feel comfortable that people get convicted with. 
You're familiar with the 2008 ballistics energy and the report put out by the National Academy of Sciences? I've read that, but not recently. Okay. And you're also familiar with the firearm slash tool mark section, well, the whole NAS 2009 report which took a broad look at all the forensic sciences, correct? Yes, I'm quite familiar with that. Okay, and in particular, the, the part that deals with the firearm slash tool mark examination? Yes, there are six stages which are developed for the firearms and tool marks. Okay, and you agree with the conclusions reached in that report? Yes. All right. Now, I asked you to kind of hone in on this so we can go through this quickly. Do you believe that the forensic practice of firearms and tool mark examination meets the Dober criteria? No. I was given the full criterion, which the, the Dober, Dober criterion, I considered the current state of the science of tool mark analysis against those criterion from a technical perspective, and I concluded that it doesn't meet all of those criteria. All right. And regarding the qualifications of the examiner, what is your opinion just in general about firearms and tool marks examiners as you've come to know them in your expert consulting work? It seems to be that the majority of them are educated academically on something other than engineering or statistics or metallurgy. I think that it's a disadvantage, but as a practitioner, if you'll follow the laboratory protocol, it doesn't make an awful lot of difference. If you're formulating those protocols, it would make a difference. But the way that the protocols are written and the way it's practiced, it gives very loose results and it's more open to the interpretation of the individual examiner and their subjective judgment. All right. Regarding the issue of some of these claims of the underlying validity or the way they do the examinations, what are the problems with that? I based it on this specific case in as much that I know, and I based on Ms. Udele's testimony yesterday, um, or based on her testimony, there were no unique breach face marks. The crime lab were unable to state how many individual characteristics constituted a match or how many there were, and they were unable to state in absolute terms or even in percentage terms how many parts of agreement you would need to consider it to be a match. So you're commenting now on the testimony of Ms. Uliday and Mr. Kolka about the way they did their examination in this case? Yes. The other thing was that the crime lab admitted that it's a subjective discipline with no set standards, and that kind of agrees with what's in the 2009 NAS report. Okay, and here, you said again, no set procedures, unarticulated standards, correct? Yes, that was in the NAS report. And is that one of your major problems with the lack of science when it comes to the way they do this firearms examination? <coughs> yes. Do you agree with Mr. Tobin and the NAS report that the concept of uniqueness has not been scientifically established? Yes, I do. Okay. And do you agree with the NAS report and Mr. Tobin that there's no, there are no known rates of error for how often the examiners get it wrong? Yeah. I think there are various studies out there that show rates of error, but the NAS report concluded that there were no valid studies that showed the rate of error. Do you agree with that? Yes, they vary widely. Okay. Again, you've already commented on this. They can't specify a... Since there's no standards, they can't specify the number of points of similarity when they're dealing with opinion, correct? Yes, and this is from the NAS report. It's a general comment about the procedures generally, not necessarily the specific case, though it does apply. All right. Again, do you agree with Mr. Tobin and the NAS that much of the, and Ms. Eulade said it too, that what they do is basically subjective? Mm, yes. Okay, and subjective, I assume, is not something that scientists like to rely on? Yes, subjectivity results in variability of results, and that's what you don't want. Ideally, in science, you're going to get the same result no matter which individual does it or which lab does it. Okay. What is your concern about subclass issues? Subclass is a dangerous class of a tool mark. There's no real way to tell if you have subclass or not if the individual is subclass, unless you have two or more components of firearms, which you know were made sequentially, and you can identify that they all do have the same mark, and it was a subclass tool mark. You have no way to determine that they're individual or subclass. So, as I recall, the subclass versus individual, individual might be unique to a particular firearm because it ha is a rare pattern or the way it was made or whatever. 
And then subclass, you were, I believe, might be something that's maybe in a number of firearms because they were made right around the same time, by the same tool, by the same manufacturer, something to that nature. Is that correct? Did I? Yes, the basic principle is that just as you're saying that the firearm is the tool when a bullet or a cartridge case goes through it and the tool leaves marks on the ammunition components which you can identify. Right. The tool that made those components or the tool that made the tool in effect can also transfer its characteristics to the gun components and it can do that to a large number of gun components so you have quite a large pool of components with similar markings on them which are subclass in nature because more than one gun or more than one component will have them. You had talked just a minute about a particular case study that you're familiar, familiar with. We'll get into that in a minute. What about the issue of reliable application of the theory and trying to determine whether or not you have, you can identify a particular firearm? What is the problem there with the way they do it? Well, I think basically what I'm saying is that if you don't have a reliable, repeatable process, then you can't reliably because by definition it isn't a reliable repeatable process. Alright, this is just an example of showing what a bullet could look like after it's been fired out of a gun, correct? Yes, this is an example of a bullet in very good condition that was fired into a recovery system and recovered. And you can see on there the lands and grooves which would be class characteristics and within those lines and grooves there are very fine lines which would be the individual characteristics. Okay, and you say this was fired in a recovery system. When they test fire bullets in the lab, normally how do they do that? What types of recovery systems do they have? You can fire them into water, you can fire them into a recovery box which is filled with shredded gum. Okay, and the why do they fire it into a recovery box? Recovery system rather than just firing it into a dead pig or something like that. Why would you do that? Generally, you want to decelerate the bullet in a uniform manner so that you deform it as little as possible. And the water or the cotton waste is a good way to do that. Now, the bullet oftentimes, though, isn't it true that the bullets they're comparing their test fires to are not in pristine condition? Yes. Generally, if you're in a street situation or a case situation, the bullets have passed through people or they hit furniture or cars. They can be fairly well beat up. They usually look much worse than the test fire. Yes, it would be unusual to have a bullet from an actual case which was as good as the one in this picture. Okay, what is this an example of? This is an example of a side-by-side -side comparison of two bullets. The one on the right was recovered from a victim's head, and the one on the left is a test fire from the suspect firearm. And the one on the right basically shows you have deformity there, just going into someone's head. All right, and this is a non-match. Yes. You can see that the class characteristics are different. The width of the lands and grooves were different. Okay, this is the sort of thing that forensic examiner would see if they're looking through their comparison microscope, correct? Yes. If the class characteristics were different, you wouldn't take the analysis any further. That would eliminate the gun. Can you be more specific about why the class characteristics are not the same? In this particular example? In this example. Oh, it would have been a different gun that was used. Okay, and this was... Are you saying this was known different guns? No. Really, this shows you two things. The example on the right is to show you that the lands and grooves do get deformed somewhat when the actual bullet goes into a victim or a piece of furniture. This particular one was out of someone's head. So it isn't as easy to determine exact measurements or exact comparisons as it looks when you have pristine bullets. But the difference between the land impression that we're looking at here or there, rather, it's a lot wider on the bullet from the head than it is on the test-fired bullet. You can touch that screen and show us what you're referring to. It should make a mark. Yeah, what we're doing here, this is the upper limits of the land impression, and this is the lower limit, and you can see on this bullet it's wider. Oh, I see. I see what you're talking about. How do I erase those lines? On the bottom right? I'm sorry, bottom left. What does this slide show? These are two bullets that I fired into a recovery system and I knew they were from different guns so I know that they're not a match and this is what they look like under the comparison microscope. Did you do this? Did you test this firearm? Yes. So you used two different guns. So you knew they were not a match and then you took, compared the two bullets. You're just using this as an example to show us what a non-match would look like? Yes. These were two Smith & Wesson revolvers of the same model but different guns. 
Okay, it looks pretty similar to me. Tell me why it's not a match. What you're trying to do, you can see on the left, the, the lines on here are striations. It's like uh, matching barcodes. This line down the middle is the dividing line between the two bullets. And you'll see there's a lot of striae here, which are horizontal lines on here that Depending on how you count, there's either hundreds or thousands of them and how much detail they go into. And what they're trying to do is match those up to the ones on the other side to see if there's a good agreement between the two bullets. All right, now how do you determine, I guess, if you put two bullets under a microscope, do you have to rotate the bullets or try to make sure, how do you decide which part of the bullet to look at when you're doing this examination? You mount these bullets and you have a system on the stages where you can put the bullets on and this uh, little knob on each end, you can turn them and rotate those bullets through 360 degrees. Um, what you do is look on one bullet and find an area that you think looks quite distinctive and has good prominent markings on it. And then you will take the other bullets and see if you can match it up to those prominent markings. Okay. What's this an example of? This is the same gun only this is two bullets fired out of the same gun and this shows what a match would be because I know they came from the same gun. This is something that you did? Yes it is. And you fired and you knew that you were firing the bullets from the same gun in your recovery system? That's correct, yes. And you put them under the microscope and photographed it to show us an example of the match, correct? That's correct. Okay, to a non-mechanical engineer and somebody who's never tried to do forensic firearms identification, to me that it doesn't look like a match. Explain why it's a match. What you find is even when you fire two bullets through the same gun, there's a certain number of these striations of the characteristics that don't match up. But overall, on this one, you can see that there's a group up here and an end about here, and there's another group here. And if you look at the individual markings within that and those subgroups, you can see that they match up even though there's a few that are a little off. That's quite normal for two bullets from the same gun. Okay, so what you're, if I understood you correctly, you're saying you knew these were fired by the same gun because you did it. Yes. And what you're saying is that even on, when you know it's the same gun, there's going to be some striations that don't match up? That's correct, yes. And some that do match up? Yes, hopefully the majority that do match up, there's always some that don't. There's no set protocol or standard as to how many matches you have to have? That's right. And every bullet has a different number of striae and marks on it. This particular one has a lot. This is just looking into, this is probably 1% of the circumference of the bullet, and you can see there's an awful lot of marks from it. So if you look, if you took the entire periphery of the bullet, it'd be probably thousands of lines on there. Some bullets have much larger ones, and you have less, so conceivably you could have a bullet from one gun that has 200 striation lines around the periphery. You could have another one that has 2,000. No one has come up with a definitive answer to say, well, you need 20%, 30%, 40% to match before you can say this is definitively from the same gun. One thing you don't do, or it's not done in this practice, is they don't use the single dissimilarity rule that Mr. Tobin referred to. That's correct, yes. Like in a fingerprint, my understanding is if you compare fingerprints, if there's a single dissimilarity, they say no match, right? I'm not a fingerprint examiner, but I have heard that. Okay, but that's not the practice in forensic firearms? No. Very often, even when you know the two bullets came from the same gun, there are a number of dissimilarities. And it's down to subjective judgment at what point you think there are too many dissimilarities and you would say it isn't a match. And at what point there are so many, they just say, well, this must be from the same gun. But based on your experience and familiarity with this field, does it vary from an examiner to, to examiner as to what their standard is? Yes, it's subjective judgment. It, it varies from lab to lab. All right, this. What is this photo an example of? This is just an example of something... Yes, these are just examples to show generally what you'd expect to see. This is the rear end of a 45 ACP cartridge case that was fired in a gun, and the point in the middle here is the firing pin impression. So that part, there was the firing pin impression, and the larger round piece in the middle is the primer. All right, so this is just an example of what the firing pin impression would look like on the back of a shell casing? Yes, it's an example of what a firing pin impression could look like. There are other shapes that you could have. 
Okay. What is this an example of? This is the extractor mark. There's a claw in there that grabs the cartridge case, so it kind of looks like that, and it grabs the end of the rim of the case. And when the gun fires, it pulls the empty case out, and then it hits the ejector, and it's ejected clean. So the ridge is back behind the rim and pulls the bullet out of the barrel, right? Yes, it pulls the empty cartridge case from the barrel. The case, yeah, right. And on a previous slide that we have, we were looking right on the back of the cartridge, and this is looking from the other the other angle looking into the room. Okay, what is the next slideshow? This is an ejector mark. So when that case is pulled out of the chamber, it comes back really quickly. There's a steel pin that is sticking out of the back of the gun, and the case comes very quickly. It, it hits it, and that flips it out and gets ejected from the gun. So these last three slides you showed are typical markings that you'd expect to find on a fired shell casing? Yes. The firing pin impression, the ejector mark, and the, what was the other one? The extractor mark. The extractor mark. Okay, now this is a case study you wanted to talk about. What is the point of this case study you wanted to talk about? The point of the case study is that there are two cartridge cases here. Actually, there's more than two, but there's two groups. This was from the Puerto Rico Crime Lab, and they claimed that a certain gun fired the cartridge cases that were recovered at the scene. And I went and test fired the gun, and they were totally different, major different. Yet everyone in the Puerto Rico crime lab said that they were 100% sure that they came from the same gun. So you differed from what the crime lab people were saying? That's correct, yes. Was the crime lab people all members of AFTE? Yes, they were. Okay. Oh, for the record, there was also another independent consultant who was a member of AFTE, and he agreed with me. All right. What is this first slideshow regarding this case study? The one on the left, which is Exhibit 7-E3, is one of the cartridge cases that was recovered from the scene. Okay, what is the one on the right? The one on the right is one of the cartridge cases that I test fired in the suspect's gun. And did you, you test fired it in a gun that was recovered that the law enforcement was trying to say was the weapon involved in the case? Yes, that's correct. And in your opinion, are these a match? No, they're nowhere near it. Okay, can you explain why they're not a match? What we're looking at, I base this on breech face marks and firing pin impression marks. And what we're looking at is the primer in the middle. And if you look at each example there, just looking at this overall picture, if you look at it, they look quite different to me. I would assume they do to everyone else. There's a part in the middle, which I usually refer to as a donut, which is allowing the firing pin impression. And on the one from the scene, you can see it's a small, distinct one. And the one from the suspect's gun, the donut shape, takes up the entire primer. All right. Now, what is the next slideshow? What I did was compare, I, I think there were something like 8 to 11 cartridges found at the scene, and they were all very similar. So I compared two examples from the scene to see how repeatable the markings were on them. So these are the two casings that were found at the scene. And what is your opinion regarding these two casings? They have a lot of similarities, and I concluded that they were fired in the same gun. Okay, and this is showing the whole back of the shell casing. I think the next slide zooms into the primer area, correct? Yes. If you zoom in on that, you can see that the donut shape, which is a function of the breech face of the gun, it's a breech face feature. So the donut shape on each one, if you look at those, they look the same, and there's a little kidney shape defect here. And it's also on the other in the same location. And then the breech face marks, you can see some lines running across on the rest of the primer, and those are the same on each one, too. Okay, and this next slide, I believe, zooms in even closer? Yes, this is looking at the firing pin impression, and we're looking right in the bottom of that firing pin impression. So what we have here, you can see there are a lot of similar marks, and again, this isn't a printing press, which reproduces precisely over time. You, over time, you do get a little variation, but there's enough here to say that there's a distinctive line up here, and you'll see it on here as well. Okay. And then there's a mark down here, and there's one there too. And when you get these angular rings which are running around and you have them on here too, um, so when, when you do that side-by-side -side comparison, it's evident that there are a lot of features that are the same. So it's your, it would be your conclusion based on the comparison of these two bullets found at the scene that these show a lot of similarities in what you would say are, were probably fired by the same gun or how would you express that? Yeah, I'd say there were a large number of similarities and there was a very high probability they were fired from the same gun. Okay, the next set of slides. What does this show? This is two that I had test fired in the suspect's gun. 
in that same in the suspect gun? Yes, they were fired in the suspect gun, so I know they were fired in the same gun. Okay, and this is a zoom in? Yes, so again, what we're looking at here, if you look at the donut shape, it's taken up most of the primer, not just a little part around the firing pin impression. And it also has very distinctive shape. It's got a jagged edge to that donut shape, and if you compare the two side by side, you can see that those jagged edges do, do reproduce. And this is a zoom in that actually show the firing pin mark? Yes, and when you look at this firing pin impression, this is looking into the bottom of the firing pin impression. And if we go into this area here, you'll see there is a, there's a smooth area on each one, and that's a very distinctive shape, and the shape is the same on each one. All right, now what does this next slide show? Uh, this again, we're back to where we have them side by side, so the ones on the scene is on the left, and the one I test fired in the suspect's pistol is on the right. So then this is zooming in again. And that's the firing pin impression, right? Looking into the bottom, and you can see that they're different. Okay. Now, the well, let me ask you this. During this case that you were working on, did you were you able to talk to the prosecution's experts? No. Okay, so you don't know what criteria they were using as far as the number of similarities when they formed that conclusion? Just from the testimony yesterday, which I heard, which was they didn't count them or they didn't know how many. So this is, is an example of where you got two, you got you and another guy agreeing that it's not a match, and you got how many were on the other side? There were a lot of people in the crime lab down there. I don't know how many that testified, but at least two of them agreed. I think more than that said they they had. So you actually got two saying it's a match, you got two saying it's not a match. At least two. I think they indicated that more people from the crime lab looked at it and they all thought they were all 100% sure that it was a match. In your opinion, it wasn't a match? No, there's no way. This is one of the most different things you could get. Okay, now we've already got the NAS report into evidence, but I just want to talk a little bit about it. You're familiar with how the NAS report was the 2009 NAS report was put together, correct? Yes. And the parts that you think in that report that were that are pertinent, we didn't give the court all these. We just gave him, him the six pages or so that talk specifically about firearms and tool mark examinations. But you, in your opinion, there are other parts of the report that were pertinent. One was impartiality and the other one was qualifications. The other was the way they write their reports, correct? Yes, that's correct. The report was divided up into a number of technical areas, but in addition to the technical aspects, they also discussed impartiality at the crime lab, qualifications of the workers in the crime labs, and the way that the reports are written. The report, you're the one who told me this, this was commissioned, the NAS report was commissioned by the U.S. Congress. Yes. And what does the NIJ stand for? That's the National Institute of Justice. All right, and it that report, the formulation of it took a number of years to come up with, correct? Yes, it was a large committee and they spent several years collecting data and then producing the report. Okay, the participants were who? There was a panel of leading scientists, lawyers, and judges. There were 52 scientists, 20 support staff, and then they had 70 consultants from academia, government, and industry, and then there were another 27 reviewers. So they put considerable effort and work from a broad-based spectrum. Yes, it was a big team and they put a lot of effort into it. All right, and the basic conclusion, I won't use your words, that's your slide, but basically they found problems in many, many forensic areas. The one they said that was the least troubling was the DNA, but the rest of them said that for all the rest, they said there's problems as far as the scientific validity of these other forensic disciplines, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and you've already, the report is critical about qualifications of a lot of people in the crime lab, but, and you say that's true from what you gathered in forensic firearms examiners f across the board, not all of them are like that, but quite a number of them. Yes, there's a very wide range of academic qualifications. Some people just left school and started work and then drifted into this. Those people who do have degrees, they range from psychology, English literature, history, nursing, there's a really wide array.